Hey there, the Netroberg here. This will be the last video for the, let's say, the static and basic routing concepts. And we will be talking about VRFs or virtual routing and forwarding instances. So it should be a pretty interesting video. If you feel like it is a bit overwhelming, don't be afraid. It, it is a bit of an advanced topic, but just try and set up what I'm showcasing in the labs as well, just to try and get a feel for VRFs. Anyways, I'm not going to keep you any longer. Let's get into the video. I hope you enjoy. So let's talk a little bit about VRFs or virtual routing and forwarding instances. Now, you've seen us talk about routers and I'm just drawing a little route here just to paint a little picture because each router or each network device effectively has the role of forwarding packets until it can get to its end destination for that end-to-end -end communication to take place. Now you've seen on your marketing perhaps that on your routing table you've got what we call the main routing table which is what the Microtech will use for its own lookups and how to get to certain things. Um, so this is also what the router will use for its own internet breakout, as well as doing stuff like getting to DNS services or whatever you've specified in the routing table. Now, it's nice for routing tables because you already know that you might have routes like 10, 0, 0, 0, 0, slash 24 as a prefix that might exist in your routing table, which the router will then know how to forward or get to that specific destination based off of uh, what gateway is specified or if it learned the route dynamically or not. Now, what if I told you, you can actually break up your router into multiple different routing instances into different VRFs. Now, this is a bit of an advanced topic and it's not something that the MTCRE expects you to know thoroughly, but it does expect you to at least understand that different routing tables can exist on a router or perhaps even how to implement something like VRF Lite. Now, in essence, what this means is each VRF that you specify will now have what we call a routing mark associated with it. And then all the packets that arrive inside of that VRF will then make forwarding decisions based off of this new routing table, this new VRF that you might have defined. Now, it's really as simple as just going into your IP routes and then going to the VRF tab. And then from that VRF tab, you can actually give it a name or a routing mark. So I might just call it VRF1. And with that mark, you can also then specify stuff like which interfaces that you want to bind to the VRF, and then which, if, if any IP addresses are assigned to those interfaces, they will automatically be moved or shifted into the VRF, into its own routing table. And then you can also specify specific routes statically or dynamically in that VRF. Now, this is very useful for ISP spaces because you might, um, be a let's say medium sized to large isp you're starting to get some pretty big customers enterprise grade customers and they have pretty big networks let me tell you they might have hundreds of offices and they have hundreds of thousands of the, not hundred thousand subnets but a, a many different subnets for each of their offices and dmz's and servers and stuff so the moment you start having a lot of big customers you will run into issues where the customers may have overlapping and subnets they might might have private addresses that are exactly the same and if you just have one router in your core network um, needing to forward packets or traffic to a specific customer how's it going to know that it needs to send this 10 000 24 to which customer because you can only define on the main routing table to one specific destination or you could do something like ecmp but then the, the customers are going to get some weird jarbled very weird stuff happening. So VRFs fix that for us because then we can create a VRF for each customer. So you can create them their own routing instance or think of it as their own routing cloud that they can use now to get onto the network, to get onto their sites or their internet. And then overlapping subnets will exist, but they'll be in their own VRF. So they won't know about each other. No packets will be forwarded between these two different VRFs because everything sticks to its own cloud. I think the easiest uh, thing that I can compare VRFs to for, for somebody to understand is it's very similar to VLANs. Now with VLANs, you know that you might tag a VLAN for a specific service. Maybe you say these are your data or voice or whatever ports, but you might tag a port to a specific VLAN and then only devices in that VLAN can communicate with each other. 
VRFs is exactly the same, but it works on the layer three concept, on an IP address concept. So now packets will only forward to each other inside that specific VRF, inside that specific cloud. So you don't need to worry about customers again having the same subnets. You don't need to tell them, hey, you need to change your subnet because my other customer is using the subnet, <laughs> which is awesome. Now I'm going to show you how to set up what we call VRF Lite in, in EVE now. And it's a concept where we're just going to use it on a single router and then we're going to differentiate certain services but i i'm hoping that in the demonstration of the video it, it at least shows you how vrf functions and how easy it is actually to set up so let's get into the eve portion now all right i just quickly configured a new lab on eve because i feel like if we want to just explain the concept of VRFs, it might be a bit cleaner if we do it this way. So in essence, all we're going to do is we're going to work on a CPE. We're going to be configuring something called VRF Lite, which just means we're just setting up VRF on a single router so that we can differentiate some services. And what you'll see is we're going to be basically be splitting the routing tables of this router. And we're going to be integrating a lot of the previous things we've learned from previous lessons in this video. So that's going to be pretty, pretty cool. All right, so I'm going to log on to this CPE. Um, what I might do is just quickly add Romon because I didn't do that. So let's just do a tool, um, Romon set enabled, yes. Otherwise I need to connect uh, through this other router. Tool Roman set enabled, yes. All right, so let's go for it. Let's connect onto Roman. Admin blank. And then we should see our CPE, which we're going to connect to. And once I'm in the CPE, we're going to go over routing tables again. So to access our routing tables, we're going to go to IP routes. And I want to point out again, this guide is specifically for router OS version six. With version seven, there is a bit of a change because um, with version six, you've got this drop down box, which will show you all of the routing tables that you have. Whereas version seven, you just have one big route list, and then you'll see which VRF or routing table a uh, prefix might belong to by seeing uh, what the at is you might see it's at customer one or at vrf one or something like that but let's just focus on the version six stuff i do think that marketing might bring the drop down box to version seven but uh, it's it's not there yet anyways we've got a routing table and from this routing table we can see we've got a default route out we've got two subnets for our WAN connections, which are running over VLANs. And then we have two, let's say LAN subnets. Maybe one is voice, maybe one is data. It doesn't really matter too much, but we can see there is on ether two, there is 192.168.2.0 slash 24 configured. Whereas 172.16.200.0 slash 24 is configured on ether three. Now we can see there is supposed to be two VRFs. And what we're going to be doing right now is we're going to be creating a new routing table a virtual router so to speak on the cp to differentiate a little bit of the traffic so to add a vrf it's really straightforward on router os version 6 you just go to the vrf tab you click on the plus and now the routing mark so this is the mark that packets will receive to show that they're inside that vrf all of the packets inside this vrf will have the same routing mark so that they so that the router knows how to communicate with the interfaces and where to push traffic out, etc. So let's just give this the name of VRF1, or let's make it VRF2. I'm actually going to um, not do VRF1. We're going to just leave that as the main routing table. So let's let's just call that main. Um, let me just uh, make that a bit nicer looking again. There we go. All right, so the main routing table will exist and then we'll have VRF2, which will now be our other, let's say the voice network or something. So what we can do is we can bind interfaces inside of that VRF. So we can assign interfaces to a VRF and then any IP addresses that are assigned to those interfaces will then effectively belong to that VRF as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say my WAN voice. I want that to be a part of this VRF. I'm going to click apply and I can also just click on the drop down and I can set ether. I believe three was also another interface that was going to the voice. Uh, so let's just see. That's correct. 
I've actually got my land subnet swapped around. I, I just see that now. So let's just quickly do this. Even though the colors don't match, this is how it's been configured. And what I'd like to do now is go back to my routes. And what you'll see is here, we can see the routing mark in the all tab as well. But if you go to our main routing table now, you'll see a bunch of the routes have disappeared. But you'll also see there's a new entry for the VRF2, which means those interfaces now belong to their own VRF, their own way to get and communicate on the network. Now, what does this mean for us? Not much yet, because effectively we've just broken connectivity between the main and uh, VRF2 networks. And I'm just going to log on to a virtual computer that I've got here. And then I just quickly want to see, can I get to my default gateway? So let's just quickly check that out. I'm going to do an IF config, just see what this PC's address is, 172.16.200.100. I should be able to ping 172.16.200.1, which is the default gateway, which is super. And before this change, this machine had internet access, but right now it's failing. And the reason it's failing is if I go to my MicroTik and I look at the routing table for VRF2, there's no way for this to get out to the internet. Even though a route exists on the main routing table, I've now effectively only have access to these directly connected networks on this router. So let's fix that. So what I could in essence do is I can add a new route as well. I'll make this a default route out and I'm going to specify the gateway as the voice VLAN that I've set up between my networks. So I've got a WAN with a data VLAN and a voice VLAN. So let's use what the gateway for the voice VLAN is. So 10, 1, .1. I'll hit apply and now we can see I've added a default route and one important thing that I, I didn't mention when I just open this up again if you create a route while you're inside that VRF it will automatically fill in the routing mark for you to say anything that you are working on in this table will be for this routing table or this VRF now if I go back to that machine Let's quickly see if I have internet access now. And it appears I do not, but I also know why that is. And the reason why that is, is I haven't set up any NAT rules on this router. So let's just quickly add that as well. So let's do a source NAT out. And what I'll do is I'll say anything that's leaving out of the WAN data, as well as the, the WAN voice, I want to NAT out. So let's say anything that's also going out of the when voice mask copy and also the when data mask that so now my voice and data when will be masqueraded so now if i go back to that machine we can see i do have internet access out i can actually work normally again now that's great because now i've got two separate routing instances on a router but I don't necessarily have a way now for the machines to directly communicate. Now, maybe this is maybe what you wanted to do. You wanted to split your stuff and you didn't want to fiddle around with VLANs and firewall rules and whatever. So a VRF is a, definitely a way to get around that so that your subnets are completely segregated so that networks cannot communicate with each other. But in my example, we, I, I said this is kind of maybe a phone network or something. So there might be a good chance there is an IT person that's going to be working from the LAN network or the data network. And they might want to be able to log onto a phone to configure it or set up a, a account or say which server it registers to and all that stuff. So I'm just quickly going to show you how to route leak as well, which you can do with Mangle rules or you can do with the IP route um, rules as well, which is something I should have actually discussed in a previous video, but I didn't. So this is actually a, a perfect opportunity to go over them because if you look at your route list or your IP routes, you've got a rules tab as well. Now the IP rules is actually a very dumbed down version of Mangle rules. It's still going to use the firewall to process it. But if you click on this plus, you can actually now specify stuff like a source and destination address as well as a routing mark. But the action is pretty important because you can set an action, you can tell it look up and then tell it which table to look up in. Because what I want to do now is I'm going to navigate back to that, uh, let's say that device that's in the phone network. And from there, can I ping 192.168.2.100? 
No, I cannot. And that is supposed to be this PC3 on the left hand side. Now, if I want to make this work, I can do it with some very basic route leaking with the IP rules. And what I'll do is I'll just say anything from the phone network 172.16 um, 200 slash 24 wanting to go to 192.168 slash 24 I'm going to do a lookup against the main routing table because the destination exists in the main routing table. So I'll apply this. And then similarly with other route concepts, what goes out must come back in. So we need to have what we call maybe a reverse route lookup, a reverse route. So let's just copy this rule. And then all I'm going to do is just change the sources and destinations around. And now my lookup will be against VRF2 because now I'm going to say anything that's coming from the LAN network, 192.168.2.0.24, wanting to go to the phone network, do a lookup against VRF2. I'll apply this. And now if I go back to my machine, let's see if I stop this and run another ping. It's actually still failing, but it should actually work. I, I suspect it's actually something with that machine. So let me just quickly get onto it as well. Because I see this has like a little hour clock thing, which tells me the config hasn't properly um, set. So let's just jump in there. So let's see, can I ping 192.168.2.1? I can. Can I ping 172.16200.100? Network is unreachable. So let's just see if I do a route. Um, I should have a default route out. So let's just do route add uh, default gateway 192.168.2.1. Let's see, can I ping now? I can. Okay, so the reason I was failing before is this machine, I didn't set a default route properly. Um, but that was something with the startup config that I must have made a typo on. Anyways, let's go back to our phone computer and let's just see, can I ping 192.168.2.100? And I can ping now. So this would now make my phone administrator very happy because now this person can still log on to the phones from the LAN network. All right, so that's been a basic overview of how we can configure VRFs on our devices. So we can essentially create multiple different routing instances that the router can use to look up route entries, which is again, extremely useful, especially the higher you start moving up the ISP networking rank, you'll see, you'll start working with VRFs actually quite a lot because it is a concept that is frequently in use because you need some type of mechanism like VRFs when you start having multiple big enterprise customers and they might and probably do have overlapping subnets so vrfs definitely eliminates that type of scenario and issue from occurring and you will learn more about vrfs in the mtc i and e which i'm also considering making a course about but at least now you can see how useful vrfs can be because you can essentially break your router up into different blocks if you need to to um, deliver specific type of services if you want. Anyways, I'm going to end off the video here. I'd like to thank the people on YouTube members and Patreon for helping, um, just donating to the channel in, in essence. You guys do help out so much and I appreciate it a lot. And I'm also looking forward to the next videos we're gonna start making, which is the OSPF stuff for the MTCRE. It's really going to be a lot more fun. Um, I love dynamic routing because it's such a crucial part of any network. And I hope I can get you to also share that same type of passion that I have when it comes to routing and dynamic routing especially. So catch you guys in the next video. See you around.